All right, so what I've done here is I've put together two chapters, cell respiration and photosynthesis, because they're very closely related. And you can kind of see that in our cover sheet here, that the products of one become the reactants for the other. So light energy comes in, just as an overview, this is our sun, um, hits the chloroplast, and photosynthesis occurs. Now in photosynthesis, what ends up happening is we make glucose, C6H12O6, and photosynthesis also releases oxygen sort of as a waste product. Those two products are actually the reactants for the mitochondria to perform cell respiration. So cell respiration takes oxygen and glucose, produces carbon dioxide as a waste product, and water. And those two products can then be recycled back to photosynthesis again. So the reactants of one are the products of the other. Uh, notice chemical energy coming out here. Remember, um, ATP is a product of cell respiration. And of course, along the way, heat is a product of both of these processes. So this is sort of an interrelationship. One uh, thing I want to mention now before we even start, just a reminder, that only plants and some algae are able to do photosynthesis, but cell respiration occurs in all living things. And that's a common misconception that, oh, plants do photosynthesis, and then animals do cell respiration. No, plants do photosynthesis, but plants also do cell respiration, as do animals, funguses, um, you know, bacteria, everybody, every living thing does some form of cell respiration. Now, they don't all use mitochondria, because bacteria don't have mitochondria, but they all do cell respiration. Okay, so um, let's start with a little bit about energy flow, so an overview. So for, for most ecosystems on Earth, sunlight comes in, this is our energy source, it then gets converted into various forms, typically chemical energy, sugars and whatnot, and then it leaves the ecosystem as heat. Remember that matter gets recycled, the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen, they're being cycled back and forth, but the energy is it's flowing, not getting recycled. So the job of photosynthesis is to capture the energy from the sunlight, trap it in the bonds of organic compounds, typically sugars, and then the job of cell respiration is to, as needed, release the chemical energy that's trapped in those bonds to generate ATP. Think of the chemical bonds in sugar as like a $10 bill, and you're breaking that $10 bill into singles so that each little single uh, reaction in a cell, each one needs a dollar, and ATP is sort of like these little dollars to run those, those individual reactions. Also, a little quick side note, that originally Earth did not have oxygen, when Earth originally formed, um, and the first bacteria that we think were the first life, the first prokaryotes, they would not have um, have used oxygen. They would have been anaerobic organisms. And the um, the first photosynthetic bacteria that appeared, they actually are what changed our atmosphere. They made oxygen as a waste product, and that oxygen then built up. It formed our ozone layer, which blocked a lot of UV light and basically completely changed our atmosphere, completely changed Earth into the habitable planet that it is today. Okay, um, another little side note that there are a few organisms, and this is rare, this is not the common um, theme. Usually the flow is that energy comes from sunlight. Um, and then all the uh, producers in the ecosystem, they capture the energy from sunlight and then it gets passed to the consumers. But there are these ecosystems at the bottom of the ocean, and they wondered, you know, where do the producers come from? Because if there's no light down there, how can they be doing photosynthesis? And it turns out that they're not doing photosynthesis, they're doing something called chemosynthesis, and you don't have to know the details of it, um, but in essence, these bacteria here, this is supposed to be the bottom of the ocean, have the ability to take in carbon dioxide and um, hydrogen sulfide and sulfur compounds, and instead of using sunlight to build energy, they're using basically energy trapped in the chemical bonds of these chemicals, sulfides and things, and they make sugar from it. And so they're doing um, not photosynthesis, again, it's called chemosynthesis, but this forms the producer layer of the ecosystems at the bottom of the ocean. And then worms and clams and things like that, they eat these bacteria, and then that basically passes the energy up the food chain. So just a definition. All right, so photosynthesis is the process of converting the sun's energy into chemical energy trapped in the bonds of sugar. Water and carbon dioxide are going to be your reactants, and they're going to become our sugar. 
And I color coded this, although this is going to come up later. But and notice, it's easy to figure out that the carbon in carbon dioxide becomes the carbon in the sugar, because carbon is only in one place on each side of this reaction. And the same with the hydrogen. Hydrogen for the sugar must come from the water, because that's the only place there's hydrogen on the left. But notice how oxygen is in two places. Uh, and a common thing they want you to know is that the oxygen from carbon dioxide becomes the oxygen in the glucose. And the oxygen that we breathe, the waste product, is coming from the splitting of water, which we will talk about. So notice that I did color code this. Uh, and number-wise, it doesn't seem to quite add up as far as all the oxygens coming from different places, but that's because this is a redox reaction, and technically this is the reduced um, simplified reaction. In the full reaction, water would actually be on both sides, and it would be a little more complicated. So don't worry about numerically why the numbers are how they are. All that really matters is that the oxygen from carbon dioxide ends up in glucose. The oxygen from water ends up as the free oxygen that's released. All right, so let's get into the details. So the first stage of photosynthesis is called the light dependent reactions. It used to just be called the light reactions. And this is the part of photosynthesis that's going to actually capture the energy from sunlight. It's going to make two products, ATP from ADP. So ADP is going to become ATP. That's phosphorylation. We learned about this in the previous chapter. And this coenzyme, it actually starts off as NADP+. Plus and it's going to pick up a hydrogen, and it's going to form NADPH. So the two products of the light-dependent reactions are basically adding a phosphate to ADP to make ATP, and adding a hydrogen to NADPH. And the location of this reaction is what's called the thylakoid membrane, which is a membrane in the chloroplast that I'm going to show you on the next slide. The light independent reaction, it used to be called the dark reactions, that's kind of an old name for it, or the Calvin cycle, is going to transfer the energy that was captured in the light reaction, so the ATP and the H from the NADPH, and combine that with carbon dioxide, and we're going to end up with sugar. So the hydrogens from the NADPH are going to be part of sugar, along with the CO2. And then what's going to run the building of sugar, because this is an endergonic process, is going to be the ATP. And the location of this process is the stroma, which is a liquidy part of the chloroplast. So let me show you. So here's a chloroplast. So these little pancakes, these are the thylakoids. And the membranes of these are where the light reactions are going to happen, or the light-dependent reactions. And you'll see an up-close membrane of this um, in another slide. Stacks of these are called grana. That's the plural. Uh, one stack is called a granum. And I don't know that you would have to know that vocabulary word. Um, because technically it's the thylakoid that's important because it's the individual um, pancake-like thylakoid membranes that are doing the light reactions, not, you know, the whole stack. But it's, it's for organizational purposes. That is the name of the stack. It's a granum. And then the stroma is all this liquid here, here, and here, and here. And that's where the light-independent reactions are going to happen. So light-dependent in the thylakoid membrane, the light-independent in the stroma. All right. So if you go back to your chemistry or physics, you may remember that light has energy, but not all light has the same amount of energy. There's different wavelengths of light, and they have different amounts of energy. And it turns out that the energy or the light wavelengths that plants specifically can use for energy come from this little section here called visible light. Oops. And uh, not even all visible light, but certain segments of this visible light range right in here from 400 nanometers to 700 uh, in nanometers or so. This is the light that's going to be used for photosynthesis. So photosynthesis um, relies on pigments, which are light absorbing molecules. So a pigment, you think of pigment as color. But in the leaf, the pigments in the leaf, uh, thylakoid, in the thylakoid membranes, contain these special things called photosystems. And a photosystem is sort of a collection of um, pigment molecules that can capture energy. So chlorophyll is the main pigment. There are two different chlorophylls, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. You don't have to know the difference between them, but they do absorb slightly different wavelengths of light. And then you have what are called accessory pigments, which are xanthophylls and carotenoids. Uh, and these are the kind of the yellows and the reds that you see in the fall. They're there all the time, but in, you don't really see them until the fall when the chloroplasts sort of shut down in the leaves. 
Um, and then since there's not making chlorophyll anymore, you see those underlying pigments. And they don't really conduct photosynthesis. The carotenoids and the xanthophylls, one of the things that they do is they block UV damage because ultraviolet light damages DNA. It damages our DNA as well. It's how skin cancer comes about. Um, but one of the ways that leaves protect themselves from ultraviolet damage are these accessory pigments. They sort of block UV light. So um, the reason plants are green, and this is really important, is that plants are actually reflecting back green light. So because green light bounces off of them, that's the color that we see, and therefore um, that's, that's why plants are green. That also means that they can't actually grow in green light. So if you look here, remember carotenoids are accessory pigments. So this light yellow line, we're gonna kind of ignore it. Chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, here are your chlorophylls. And notice they absorb really well this area, and they absorb this area, but notice they don't absorb anything in here. And the, and the colors here, the blues and yellows, would reflect back to us as green. That's what we would see. And that would also mean that if you were to try to grow a plant in green light, it would die. It would be the same as keeping it in the dark. And it would be very uh, possible that you could see a picture like this on the AP exam. And so absorption, if they're absorbing the light, the higher the peak, that's light they're using. They're, if they're absorbing it, it means that the pigment molecules are actually taking in that light and capturing the energy from it. Um, so that means these low areas here and the colors that accompany them, those are wavelengths of light that the plant can't see. Just like, you know, somebody could blow a dog whistle and sound comes out of it, but you can't detect it. Well, same thing, 600 nanometers of light, if you put a plant under that, it doesn't matter how bright you make it, the plant's gonna die because it can't use that particular wavelength of light for photosynthesis. So, um, the way that pigments work is they, again, are in these networks called photosystems. And this is a picture of what a photosystem would look like. When light hits a photosystem, the electrons in the photosystem get excited. And that's what they're showing here, that the electrons are sort of passing energy along. And what's eventually going to happen is an electron is going to get so excited, it's going to leave. And it's going to go down something called an electron transport chain. And when electrons travel down an electron transport chain, it generates energy. So there are two different photosystems. I'm going to talk about this in a second. One's called photosystem two. One's called photosystem one. And they're uh, actually attracted to slightly different wavelengths of light. So P680, this is like 680 nanometers of light, is the favorite wavelength for photosystem two. It really excites the electrons of photosystem two. And P700 or um, 700 nanometers is the wavelength of light that really excites the electrons in photosystem one. But you don't really need to know those details. So bottom line, when wavelengths of light hit, and it's got to be the right wavelength that they can detect, the electrons go down an electron transport chain in the membrane. Um, and what's going to happen is, uh, I'm going to show you on the next slide, so this is going to generate energy. So photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, they're named from their discovery. Photosystem 1 was discovered first, and photosystem 2 is discovered second. They work together. They send electrons down electron transport chains, and as they travel down that chain, they release energy, and the energy powers hydrogen pumps, hydrogen ion pumps. So you remember this from our last chapter, pumps pump things from lower to higher concentrations. So hydrogen ions are going to build up on one side of the thylakoid membrane, and that is an electrochemical gradient. And the reason why that's important is because that electrochemical gradient is going to now be used to make ATP. So here's the light hits here. The electrons pass the energy along. This electron gets so excited, it goes down an electron transport chain. And that's powering this pump. That's pumping all this hydrogen here into this space. This is the pump. This is the enzyme that actually makes the ATP. It's called ATP synthase. And as the hydrogen ions flow back through from high to low concentrations, it generates ATP. So this enzyme literally builds ATP by the flow of hydrogens. But that flow could only happen because of this electron transport chain from the excited electrons from the light. And then in the last little section here, the other thing that's made, the NADPH, is made from NADP. And to replace the hydrogen that left and the electrons that left, water gets split and oxygen is released as a waste product into our atmosphere. 
So that's the uh, that's sort of a walkthrough of what's happening in the light reaction.